All right, so today's lab class and yesterday's lab class, if you're here Wednesday, covered two different phyla. So we covered the phylum Nideria and the phylum Platyhelminthes. Uh, in the first couple slides of this uh, show, I'll go over the anatomy of uh, the Nidarians we saw. So the one that we were examining in lab was in the phylum uh, Nidaria, class uh, Hydrozoa. So this is a uh, hydra. Um, and so for these first couple slides, I'll go through anatomy. But as I'm talking, I'll try and bring up some of the key points of this, uh, these classes and this, uh, this phylum. So uh, these hydra, they're sessile. They're not moving. They're in that polyp stage. Um, and so one of the major characteristics of phylum Nidaria is that they are diploblastic. They have two major tissue types. They have the endoderm uh, and the ectoderm. So the ectoderm is this material from here to here. So that contains the epidermis. Um, so all these cells uh, are epidermal cells. There are also cnidocytes, so stinging cells are found in here. Um, let's see if I can spell cnidocytes. Cnidocytes. Okay, well, uh, if I had a pen, it would be easier. But so remember that nidocytes are those stinging cells, uh, and they have uh, a nematocyst inside of them. The nematocyst is this barbed, uh, it's really like a hair that will shoot out whenever there is a predator or prey. So these hydra uh, and all nidodarians to begin with have what's called a nerve net. And so a nerve net is just, is just this rudimentary nervous system that uh, spans the length of the body and the width. So they don't have a centralized area of nerves like we do. So we have a brain um, and so we have that bundle of nerves that controls everything we do. They just have a nervous system uh, that's spread out throughout their body. So they have that nervous system uh, and so they are reacting to any environmental stimuli. Uh, if you were in class, you saw that uh, those hydro were exploring the environment. They were feeling uh, water bubbles and the daphnia uh, with their tentacles. Uh, and as soon as they touched something uh, or another hydro touched them, they would immediately shrink away. So they're using that nerve net to control um, the nidocytes, the stinging cells, as well as uh, control the amount of hydrostatic pressure that they have inside their bodies, so controlling their movement. Um, so going back to anatomy, the ectoderm holds the epidermis. So all these cells uh, along the side here are epidermal uh, in uh, composition. This line here uh, that separates these two major tissues. Let's see if I can get it good. That's called mesoglia. And so that's this acellular uh, matrix uh, that's made of collagen and some other proteins that's excreted by uh, the endoderm. And so that's the major separation between these two uh, tissues. Um, and so everything from here to the mesoglia is what we consider endoderm. So draw a straight line. That's what uh, is the inside tissue, uh, and this is all what we would consider gastrodermis. So it all serves uh, as some sort of digestive purpose. Um, you can see all the folds in this gastrodermis. So if you travel along the outside of this gastrodermis, you can see it's not just a perfect circle. It's got all these folds in it, blah, blah, blah. So this is increasing surface area. Uh, so it's kind of like the mitochondria uh, inside of your cells that has all those folds in it. The more folds you have in an area, the more surface area you have. So the more surface area you have, the more area you can uh, use to uh, digest stuff with your enzymes. So we consider this uh, open area right here, the gastrovascular cavity. Let's see if I can draw a better line right here. So that's the gastrovascular cavity and that spans the length of uh, the stalk. Um, so it opens up at the mouth and runs all the way down to the basal disc. There's only one entrance uh, and exit to this uh, gastrovascular cavity and so this organism and all cnidarians have an incomplete digestive system. So uh, food goes in through the mouth, um, it's digested, 
any waste product still stays in the gastrovascular cavity. And when that is pushed out, it leaves through the mouth as well. So if there's only one opening, that's considered an incomplete digestive system. Uh, you'll also notice that uh, the big difference between uh, the phylum nidaria, or one of the major differences between the phylum nidaria and the phylum periphera is that uh, we're no longer having cells that are uh, digesting uh, food particles within them. We now have inter or intracellular digestion. So we have this organism that is uh, digesting particles of food that are larger than its cells. So that provides uh, enough energy to maintain the expensive uh, nervous system. So it takes a lot of calories to send nervous impulses, and it also takes a lot of calories to build uh, neurons. So that was the cross section of a hydra. Uh, here is a uh, wet mount of a hydra. So once again, we're still in uh, the phylum Nidaria, class Hydrozoa. So there's really uh, a very basic body plan shown here. So you have a stalk, which is the main part of the body, which is here. And it's this line, uh, this large, long structure that runs the length of the body. So, and it even includes this individual here. So everything that I just highlighted is the stalk. The mouth is found in this ring of tentacles. So each one of these structures here is a tentacle, and those will circle the mouth. The mouth uh, is the only opening to that. Whoop, went the wrong way. The mouth is the only opening to that uh, gastrovascular cavity, and that mouth is found right here. The basal disc, right there, is the structure uh, at the very base of the stalk here. And so that basal disc forms, or acts as uh, like almost like a suction cup. And so that basal disc is where that hydra is planted onto whatever substrate it was. When you're pipetting those hydra out of the jar, um, you're pulling uh, against the hydra with the, the pipette. So you're creating some sort of suction uh, upwards and the hydra is resisting that using uh, its basal disc. Um, when you were looking at it under a microscope, that basal disc hadn't uh, to anything yet, so it was free fl uh, floating uh, between the cover slip and the depression slide, and the hydra was really just pulling itself along using its tentacles. So remember, those tentacles uh, have nidocytes. I'm not even going to try and spell it. Uh, actually, I can try and spell N I D O C Y T E S. That's terrible handwriting, but I'm using a mouse. So those nidocytes are found inside those tentacles and along the length of the stalk. So those nidocytes have those nematocysts. Um, and then the hydro will use hydrostatic pressure, so it'll control the amount of water within one of those tentacles. If it catches a prey item or it needs to shrivel up real fast, it'll drop the amount of uh, pressure in each one of those tentacles. So if it has a food item that is clinging to with those nidocytes and nematocysts, it will then drop the pressure in those tentacles, which then contract uh, the tentacles towards the mouth, where it, from there it pushes it in and starts digesting. So that's a hydra. Um, so that was from the class Hydrozoa uh, in the phylum Nidaria. We do have other specimens for the other two classes. So we do have uh, two specimens. Well, actually, we have more than two from the class uh, Skyphozoa, so we have tons of specimens of jellyfish, and then we have even more specimens of anthozoa, so we have corals, uh, sea anemones, sea fans, uh, and the like. Um, so those are all found on uh, the left side of the room, um, the right side if you're facing the uh, projector. Um, so feel free to uh, go over there, take pictures, there's hand sanitizer, so if you do pick up a uh, organism, just use hand sanitizer afterwards so you're not spreading contagions uh, to yourself. Plus, we can't wash most of those organisms. So on to the next uh, group. Uh, so this is the phylum platyhelminthes. Platy meaning flat, helminthes meaning worm. Um, so we're into the flatworms. 
And so the organism that you see in front of you is in the class Turbillaria. It's a free-living, so non-parasitic organism. Um, so this one was a planaria, uh, which most of you guys saw. Uh, they had a really personal, not personal, personable uh, look or appearance to them because they had those large eye spots. So this is the cross section uh, of the middle of the organism. So on that slide, if you recall, there were three cross sections, one from the uh, front of the organism, one from the back. This one's from the middle. So the shape of that planaria is kind of like that. And so we're looking at it from right here. So this being its head, there's an eye, there's an eye. So that line is where uh, we're looking at this organism from. So the difference, one of the major differences between uh, the phylum platyhamenthes and the phylum nideria is that uh, the phylum uh, platyhamenthes is triploblastic. So we have three major groups of um, tissue. So we still have the ectoderm being this outer layer here. So this is comprised of an epidermis. So there's still epidermal cells uh, that line this uh, organism. We have mesoderm, which is all this material uh, along here, like that. And so this is all mesoderm. Inside the mesoderm is a circle. And so each half of the uh, planaria will have um, this middle section here, right here. So this is the gastrovascular cavity. There's one on the other side over here, uh, but it's covered up with that little word bank that I made. Inside each of these gastrovascular cavities is the gastrodermis. So you have the cavity here, and then all this cell, uh, cellular matrix is the gastrodermis. So that's what you see here. Um, the lines are starting to cross, but you get the picture. So these platyhelminthes, uh, especially in the class uh, Turbillaria, they don't have a circulatory system, so they can't diffuse or they can't transport uh, oxygen or nutrients throughout their body. So they have a really large digestive system uh, that's branched off uh, so that they can transport nutrients to parts of the body that need it most. Um, and once again, they have folds in that digestive system to increase surface area. Uh, so they can increase the amount of contact between the digestive system uh, and other cells. And as so, so they can increase the amount of surface area they have um, for digesting food particles that they intake. So let me get rid of all of this. So the other tissues that are found is uh, the endoderm. So the endoderm is this structure in the middle right there. So that is endoderm. That's the middlemost uh, tissue. And so this is also known as the pharyngeal cavity. So this right here is the opening to the pharynx. So once again, we still have an incomplete digestive system. There's only one opening uh, to this system. So we call it a mouth, um, but both food and food waste uh, exit through the mouth. So we can consider this, that pharyngeal cavity. Uh, if you look at a planaria, um, you look at a diagram of it, it's pharynx kind of looks like this, kind of like a T. So there are these two tubes um, that go to each of the gastrovascular cavities. And then from there, they branch out in both directions. So this structure right here, that I just put an arrow at, that would be the mouth, uh, the only entrance to the digestive tract. Um, kind of looks like that. So if you can imagine a uh, tapeworm looking uh, uh, long, long lengthways, uh, and you're looking from the top down, so dorsally, uh, you could see uh, this structure right here. Um, this would be the pharynx. And when we take it as a cross section, so we're looking at this organism like that. So we've dissected it, and we're just looking straight uh, at that cross section there. So this 
that tube, that hole in the middle, is that. It's that hole. That's the basic anatomy of a planarian. Um, so once again, that's in the class Turbularia, the free living, uh, the only free living class in phylum Platyhelminthes. After we looked at uh, the planarian, uh, we played around with a living one, and you saw those two eye spots. So those eye spots are used to um, detect both light and dark surfaces. Planarians like being uh, in dark areas, so they uh, will search out darker uh, areas. When we put them on a bright light, uh, such as a beam of light from a microscope, we're basically blinding them. Uh, so that's probably why they were uh, exploring it so much. Um, basically, they were probably trying to find a way out of the environment we put them in. So our last uh, class that we looked at was class Cestoda. So these are the tapeworms. We'll see for class. So um, I talked about the uh, anatomy of a tapeworm and also the life stages that different segments go through. So if we look at this tapeworm here, uh, this entire structure is the scolex right here. And so basically you can consider that the head of a uh, tapeworm. Let's remove some of these lines, make it a little bit neater for us to Oop. Cut this one out. All right. So this area is the scolex. This tip part with all these barbs uh, is the rostellum. So it uses that rostellum and all those barbs to cling on to the inside of an intestine, uh, intestinal wall of its host. So these organisms are entirely parasitic. They don't have a complex digestive system. It's been secondarily lost. So uh, when they're si sitting in a intestine of its host organism, um, they're not digesting large pieces of uh, food or other particles. They're just absorbing nutrients through their suckers. So there's a sucker here. There's a sucker here. Uh, and then there's two others that you can't see on the other side of this organism. So those are suckers here and one there. The region from uh, the neck, or the region from uh, these suckers to the very first proglottid, this is called the neck of a uh, tapeworm. So that's what that is. Um, Every single one of these segments afterwards, uh, after the scolex, uh, is an immature proglottid. So you can see each of these segments. So there's a segment, 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 segment. Each one of those is immature proglottid. So in the next slide, I'll talk about what each of those uh, stages of a proglottid is. So here we have a immature and a mature proglottid. There's also a gravid proglottid, which I'll get into later. But an immature proglottid are found closer to the anterior end of that ta uh, tapeworm. So those uh, immature proglottids look like this. So this one here is a immature proglottid. Oops. That didn't look good. So this is an immature proglottid. It doesn't have fully formed uh, reproductive organs. So all these small dots you see uh, in the tapeworm segments on the right, uh, those are all uh, really rudimentary testes, but you can see um, the genital pore duct. So in, if it's for a male, this is called the vas deferens. So right there. For a female, it's called the vaginal canal. So vas deferens transports sperm uh, from the testes to the genital pore, uh, and then a vaginal canal transports eggs from the ovaries to the genital pore. So a genital pore um, is seen really only in, well, it can be found in immature uh, proglottids, but it's much more distinct in mature proglottids where uh, the reproductive organs are much more uh, fully, fully grown and operational. So I'll point this out on the immature proglottid. There's a really thick cuticle 
on these creatures. Um, so they live in a really harsh environment. Um, the stomach acid in a host is constantly tearing away or dissolving or attempting to dissolve uh, these organisms. Uh, so they keep building up this cuticle, which is this structure right here. So that's a cuticle. Uh, so that's made out of chitin. Uh, in most cases, actually, I believe it's chitin. Uh, so a protein. Um, and that's protecting uh, these reproductive units, uh, these proglottids, from being dissolved uh, in the battery stomach acid. So that is an immature proglottid. Um, mature proglottids, such as the one right here, so this is a mature proglottid, will have fully functional uh, reproductive organs. So here you have ovaries, so right here. Here's one ovary, uh, and then here's a second ovary right here. Oops. So those are producing female gametes uh, and eggs. Eggs will travel either to uh, the genital pore through the vaginal canal so the genital pore is this structure right here. It's kind of cut off uh, in this picture, but it's just this bump on the outside of that cuticle. It can also get stored uh, in uterus, uteruses uh, alongside these testes. So when they're stored uh, in the uterus, uh, they are provided with some sort of nutrition from what's called a vitellaria. So the vitellaria provides yolk, and so that's the structure right here. I wish I didn't have a red pen, that would do it much more better. But that's the vitellaria that's providing what's called vitellin, uh, and that's basically yolk uh, for these uh, fertilized eggs. So if I get rid of all these lines. So the testes are all these dark spots that you see here, um, all throughout this immature or mature proglottid. Those travel through this line here and then out to the genital pore. So that, that tube is called the vas deferens. So that transports uh, sperm away from the testes uh, to the genital pore. Or uh, it can transport it to the uterus where uh, those, fer those eggs will be fertilized. So that is uh, the anatomy of a mature proglottid and an immature proglottid. The gravid proglottid looks like this, so it has uh, a very distinct genital pore. I mentioned that on the last slide, so this here, that's a genital pore. Um, I don't know if I even can write genital pore. Right there. That's terrible writing, but you get the point. It's a genital pore, so that's where uh, eggs and sperm uh, leave the uh, proglottids from. So they'll come from the ovaries and the testes through either the vas deferens or the vaginal canal and exit through the genital pore to either fertilize other proglottids of this individual or uh, other proglottids of another individual. Fertilized eggs are stored in the uterus and so you can see all these lines um, throughout the body of this uh, tapeworm. Um, go here, 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 so on and so forth. And so those are uterus, uh, uteruses, and so those are storing the fertilized eggs. Um, and each one of those eggs, uh, each one of these uterus, contains thousands of eggs. So when a gravid, uh, when a proglottid becomes gravid, uh, it's basically just dropped off of the uh, tapeworm. So uh, that chain of proglottids will just kind of keep growing as immature proglides are added on one end, and then it'll uh, drop off gravid proglides on the other end. That gravid proglide will travel through the intestinal tract um, and leave uh, in hopes of infecting other organisms. So, so once again, the uterus is just all this stuff that you see here. So a gravid proglottid uh, and an immature proglottid are the hardest uh, to differentiate between. Just know that a gravid proglottid is much larger. Um, it has a very distinguished genital pore right here. And it has all these, uh, these uteruses full of eggs. 
uh, immature proglide won't have uh, these uteruses. It will just have small dots uh, everywhere, and those will be the testes. Um, and an immature proglide also won't have such a uh, distinct general rapport, though you might still be able to see uh, vast deferens or the vaginal canal that lead up to it. So those were the three uh, groups that we talked about in class. Um, so we went through the phylum Cnidaria. Uh, we had uh, Hydra that were in the class Hydrozoa. Uh, then we went through uh, two classes in the phylum uh, Platyhelminthes. There was the class uh, Turbularia, the free-living uh, uh, flatworms. And so we had that planarian. Uh, and then we have our parasitic uh, flatworms in the class Sesoda. So covered a lot in this week. Um, next week will be Osmo Regulation Lab. So we'll be uh, measuring the difference between uh, goldfish that have been soaking in uh, fresh water and those that have been living in salt water for an extended period of time. And we'll be doing the same with uh, potatoes. So yeah, uh, next week, uh, wear clothes to choose. Uh, and I'll see you then.